Hello, everybody. I think folks are going to be muted by default when you first join, so you'll have to unmute in order to say anything that anyone else can hear. It was great to see everybody. Hi, guys. Likewise. Courtney, fun to see you. Uh, Steve Colwell, thank you for joining. I'm hoping to, to get lots of good insights from you on your, your impressive county big year. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Is, Paul Stahl, it's both Paul and Linda Rose. Oh, great. Yeah, how are you guys? Fine. I uh, Well, we'll get to the announcements in just a minute, but I'm, I'm hoping you can join us for the, the outing on Saturday so we can meet up out in the field. All right, well, it looks like uh, most everybody has joined. Uh, people may keep trickling in. In fact, there's Sue in the waiting room. But I'm going to rely on our, our trusty, helpful co-hosts to handle admitting people. So uh, Tom Beland, uh, who's in the, the purple sweater there, and uh, Jenny Slaughter, who's on the screen with Craig. They are our co-hosts for the meeting. And Laurel is at Tom's end somewhere, hiding off camera. There she is. Hi, Laurel. <laughs> so. Uh, if you have questions or concerns, you can, you know, send them a chat message or, but they kind of keep an eye on things and help things keep running because I get very distracted, obviously, by the need to stare at all of you and talk about birds. Um, okay, so uh, welcome to this meeting of Carpentry Bird Watchers for Thursday, whatever today's date is, January 19th, 2023. Uh, the subject of this meeting is the year behind and the year ahead. So we're going to do a... Uh, that's great. So, Kim, I see you're 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 on the stationary bike there. Is that right? So impressive. I did I did a Peloton session today that was a little longer than I should have, and so I was feeling kind of out of it most of the afternoon. But hopefully, I've got my energy back now. Um, so uh, the year behind and the year ahead, we're going to talk about uh, our favorite birding experiences of last year, 2022, and then we'll also uh, have a chance to share about that, and then we'll have a chance to share about any plans or agenda we have about birding in 2023. Uh, I have a little bit of, of uh, thoughts on both those things that I'll be sharing and a little bit of a presentation set up, but mostly it's going to just be sharing with each other. So uh, hopefully you came prepared to share. And if you didn't, hopefully you can think of something to share uh, by the time we get to the, the round robin sharing portion of the meeting. Um, so uh, before we get started, a quick announcement that uh, this Saturday at 8 a.m., we will have a Carpinteria Bird Watchers outing. Uh, so everybody is welcome to join us. We will be at, let's see if I get the name right, the Rincon Bluffs Nature Preserve, I think is what it is called. And uh, we'll be actually starting from at the Carpinteria Bluffs, the Viola Fields parking right by SNS Seeds. So there's a, a map at the Carp Bird Watchers website if you go there to get details. But we'll be meeting there at 8 a.m. on Saturday and then going out and birding along the sort of bluff top trail that goes between that location and the Rincon Bluffs Nature Preserve at the east end of the Carpentry of Bluffs. But I, I still think of it as Bluffs 3, but that's kind of a, an old school designation. And now it has a much fancier name. And it's, it's cool. And they're doing neat restoration work there. And that trail just through the section in front of the... Uh, there's like some in uh, some office buildings and stuff, uh, Procore and SNS Seeds along the bluffs there, and this trail runs right in front of their offices, and it's actually really cool. You get views of the ocean, you get views of the beach, you get some nice riparian habitat with willows. Anyway, I don't want to give away all the fun, but come out on Saturday and you can see what birds are there, and uh, I will be there, and it should be great fun. Uh, I think that's it for announcements. Uh, you know, this this past week, I was at the Morro Bay Bird Festival. I don't know, did any of you go to the Morro Bay Bird Festival? I just chime in or wave your hand. David, you were at the Morro Bay Bird Festival. You're you're muted. Can you unmute and share what you what you guys did there? Either of you, <laughs> I see David and Linda are in separate windows, which which happens to me too when I'm doing something with Linda. There we go. Yay! Did that work? Yep, we hear you. Yes, Len and I decided to focus on working on our birding by ear. We actually signed up for three different birding by ear types of uh, lectures and then a field trip. And the lectures were pretty good. Uh, one of the field trips was canceled in all the rain, uh, but the other one got off. So it was a good time. 
learned a lot. Cool. Yeah, I had a lot of fun there. Uh, got rained on a lot as well. But uh, <laughs> in between the the rain or or even during the rain, you know, the, the surroundings were amazing and, and gorgeous. A lot of places I hadn't birded before. So I had a really fun time with that. Um, and, you know, getting rained on is sort of a thing. Like I think two out of the three local Christmas counts that I did this year, I spent most of the time being rained on. So I feel like I'm I'm experienced at being rained on while birding now. And I don't I don't prefer it, but I know how to deal with it. Um, OK, well, uh, let's go ahead and just just move right along because I want to keep things rolling. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I do have some uh, initial slides set up. And I always have to narrate what I'm doing as I'm doing it. Uh, this, I think, is the window that I want. All right, if I've done this successfully, you are seeing my screen. If I go full screen, does that work? Do you see my my slide there with some gorgeous pintails? Awesome. Yes. So this was, uh, I just have to share about the shot. I'm like the, well, now I actually am a grandparent. I am like a grandparent because I am a grandparent, but I want to share my photos of my my grandchildren or the birds, you know, that I saw at the beach. Um, this was down at the beach the other day and it was super windy. And this group of pintails were flying by and I think they were trying to stay low and out of the wind. So they went by right at eye level and it was just a really cool sight of them as they came blasting through. Um, so, but that's not that important. Let's move on. So first I want to talk about the year behind. So 2022. And uh, as I say, I want to do kind of a round robin and, and we can share our experiences, but I want to lead off by sharing in particular uh, about the county big year competition that uh, ended up forming. Uh, I was, you know, an enthusiastic participant in that. Uh, Steve Colwell, who's in the meeting, was an enthusiastic participant in that. David and Linda Blue, who are in the meeting, uh, all four of us basically were, were fighting it out at the top of the eBird rankings all year. And it actually became really fun. And, you know, it was not so much a cutthroat competition as a collaborative thing. Like, I can't, you know, I forgot how many times I got a text you know, in the middle of the day from one of the other three saying, oh, John, do you need this? We've got it here now. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I guess I can drop work and head up there. So there was a lot of that that happened. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about that. So if you go to the SBCO birding uh, website, there is a, uh, can I make this go away? I don't know how to do that. All right. Uh, for you folks, are you seeing like uh, an obscuring screen over the top of the slide? No, excellent. It's just on my side. Yes. Okay, I won't worry about it then. Um, so if you go to the sbcobirding.com uh, website, and look for the big years right up there. There is a discussion of, of Santa Barbara County big years. And I think we four owe them uh, verbiage. We owe them a, a description of what our experience of last year was like, because Jamie Chavez has said he will add that, which would be very cool. Uh, but here is a rundown based on that webpage with the addition in blue of the, the four of us from last year. And uh, I'd say there, you know, these are Santa Barbara County uh, birding big years that I know about. It is quite possible that some sort of stealthy, avid birder out there whose name might rhyme with Smick Smethaby uh, might have more birds uh, that would have qualified him to be on this list, but I don't know about it. He, uh, he's he's kind of cagey about his numbers. So these are the ones of, of people who publicize what they've done. Um, and as you see here, you know, Wes Fritz is the reigning champion. And, you know, based on my experience this year, I feel like he is unlikely to be uh, unseated anytime soon. But if any of you are inspired and want to go try, you know, there's still time to get going this year. Uh, but he has 358 species or had that in 2008. Um, and then Steve Colwell has placed himself atop the, the non-Wes rankings with his performance last year at, at 345. And these are ABA countable species, right? I think if you throw in the non-ABA countable species, you get four more. So he'd be at 349, but we won't count that because they don't count. Uh, I did my best to, to keep up uh, with Steve, uh, but the best I could do was 340, which was still a significant uh, increase over my previous best year in the county. So I think having an actual, having actual co-competitors really was an incentive and uh, and all those those texts to alert me to birds I needed, uh, I think were a factor too. Uh, Dave Compton and Joan Hardy back in 2000 at 337, Cher Hollingsworth in 2008, the same year Wes got his record at 334. And then David and Linda came in at 330 and 329, 
which again is right up there with the most that anyone's ever done in eBird. And as you can see, you know, all these other uh, big years here were not eBird big years uh, since either predated eBird or people weren't using it that much. Anyway, it was very exciting and very fun. Uh, I don't want to just monopolize by talking about all this. I'll, I'll maybe go over to uh, ask Steve, uh, can you give us any kind of thoughts about the year or any sort of reflection on it? It's been you know a few weeks since it ended. You know, what, do, what do you think about your, your big year effort last year? Well, what I think is it was the most fun I've ever had in a year. It was just such an adventure the whole year. And it kept coming too. Like in the beginning, there were littler adventures. And then just when I thought, oh, it's slowing down, like a whole new area would open up. Even at the end of the year, when uh, Santa Cruz Island started being a really big site. Next thing I know, I, I mean, I've barely ever been on a boat and I'm going out there every other week. So it's just one adventure after another. It's awesome. And and David and or Linda, uh, are you willing to share a little bit about just you know overall what your experience of that that big year was? Let me unmute. Okay, now can you hear me? You sound pretty good now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, kind of an echo on this end. It sounds like I. I'm getting back over here. Can you um what what may be happening is you've got Linda in the same room. I'll close the mine. Okay, yeah, that would be good. Zoom does its best, but if there's two Zoom sessions going on within earshot of each other, you know, all, uh, all chaos breaks loose. Okay. You sound great now. Okay. Um I put together four or five slides just to discuss my approach to all of this. Is it okay if I show those? Yeah, let me, um, I'm gonna stop my screen share and then I think I need to enable screen sharing. Uh, okay, so you know, I'm gonna make you a co-host is what I'm gonna do. So otherwise we'd have to trust everybody not to, not to try and take over the sharing, which I'm sure you wouldn't, but it just makes things easier if I make you a co-host. <laughs> Okay, and now I'm going to say uh, hosts only. So see if you can share your screen now using the Zoom screen share feature. Well, David's doing that. I'll just add that also, I thought it was just a fire hose of learning because every new type of bird, you know, you'd have to go learn to distinguish it from the others and where to find it and, and all the habitats we had to discover. It was astounding. I learned and so if, much. And if I can weigh in, for me, one of the most astounding things about it, like having done this several years now, again, it's a more relaxed experience when no one else is actually competing that I'm aware of. Uh, but I'm just competing against myself. But to see how impressive you were uh, as essentially a beginning birder, like at the start of this process, you had been birding less than a year, I think. Uh, Definitely a beginner. Yeah. And so to me, that was one of the most impressive things was just seeing your learning curve, you know, was kind of almost more exciting than, I mean, it was better to have you win than me win because it made for a more exciting experience for me. Um, it, it really made it a blast. And Boy, every time I birded with somebody new, like when I first birded with John, I was so like, wow, this is John Calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I was awestruck. And now and you know, like, that doesn't actually mean anything. I'm not, you can't even come in first in the competition. <laughs> oh, I think it means a lot. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Watching okay. your bird by ear in particular, boy, was that educational. Whew. Yeah, it makes a big difference. I, uh, you know, certainly can relate, uh, you know, David and Linda going up and focusing on that at the at the, the Morro Bay Festival, because it, it it really is just like night and day. And I noticed that, like, I co-led a bunch of, you know, three different uh, sessions there, three different trips at the festival, and was just kind of helping out with the, the real leaders. But I did notice that if you're, you know, you're with a group of people and they are not birding by ear, it kind of becomes tiresome pretty quick to have me just point out, oh, I'm hearing this, oh, I'm hearing this, oh, I'm hearing this. 
if they can't see them, you know, so it, it really makes a big difference. Uh, so, uh, David, are you having any luck with uh, the screen sharing? Let me unmute. You had asked Steve about screen sharing. You didn't. And Steve says, well, while you're waiting on David, and I said, that's anyway, I wasn't trying to share my screen because. Oh, yeah, go ahead and, and try and share your screen if you have not. Okay, let me see if I can't do that. Um, did that work? Uh, something is coming through. Yep, yep, we see your screen. Okay, and uh, okay. Uh, just a qu quick overview of, of my, my perspective on the big year. Um, all years are big years in one sense, but this one was, was kind of interesting. Um, you know, it started with a plan. Let me get this thing out of the way. Uh, and for me, I'd birded every day in 2021. I'd seen 296 species in the county. So the plan for 2022 was kind of already set. Uh, you know, bird every day, learn even more about the major county habitats, visit even more county birding locations, uh, you know, just see as and and understand as much as I can about what birds are out there, where they are, and when they are. And my real goal was to uh, my big goal was to finish the year with a minimum of 300 species. Uh, I thought of it as the 300 club, and I think that nine only nine e birders have made it into that club, plus the other people that you have listed there, John. And uh, just for the audience, John has gone over 300 species every year since he started birding actively again in 2018. So for, for me, it was never a question of competition because uh, uh, John already knew where all the birds were. He had been to all corners of the county. So all I had to do was sort of uh, mimic what he was doing, but I knew I wasn't going to come close, but that's okay. Uh, the other complication I had was that uh, Lynn and I were gonna be out of the county for 38 days. So would it even be possible to see 300 species in less time than that? Uh, however, I did have that secret weapon. Uh, my wife, Linda, excellent bird spotting skills, great hearing, who's always been up for the next adventure. Uh, it there's really some teamwork there that does make the dream work, if you will. Um, and so it was fun being out every day with Linda and and uh, seeing all these birds and always sitting on alert, waiting for the next rare bird to show up. Uh, really great fun. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't done a really big year, uh, it's kind of interesting. John has a, a chart he'll show you later, a graph of how many birds we all had on what day. But here's a, a quick uh, look at how it continuously slows down throughout the year. Uh, I had my 100th species by January 5th, uh, but it took until uh, over a month to see my, my 200th species. And then it took uh, three months to hit 250. And then it took uh, five months to hit 300. So that's a very slowing down. And then from October to December 25th, uh, basically three months, only 30 more species for us. But uh, fortunately for, for us, the fun thing uh, was that uh, the Williamson sapsucker uh, showed up on December 25th. So for us, a very Merry Christmas present. Uh, just some statistics for how much activity is, is sort of, uh, not not required, but uh, some of the things that actually happened. Very active, active uh, year. Uh, I did succeed in birding, birding every day of the year, and I birded in the county every day except for the 38 days uh, Linda and I were out of the county. Uh, submitted 720 checklists uh, for Santa Barbara County. I added 38 species to my county life list, uh, which is a lot because it was. It was already setting at 327 and it, they get harder and harder to add. And the big thing for me was uh, I added five species to my world life list, which brought, you know, I had a few there. It brought it up to 2,146. Uh, in fact, you probably wonder, 
what birds those were. Uh, turns out they were all pelagic species. Um, Herveris murrelet, Cook's petrel, Leach's storm petrel, Street shearwater, and least storm petrel. Uh, so that was really, really fun. Those, those were my most exciting birds because I'd never seen them before. The final result was my goal of finding 300 species in the county in a year was not only achieved, but exceeded by 10% for a total of 330 species. Uh, and that was, I never really thought of it as a competition because uh, I didn't think that Lynn and I were gonna be competitive based on some, uh, uh, you know, the lack of time in the county. Uh, and uh, it was kind of funny if, if I had been competing uh, I would have felt like I was up against the, the highly experienced pro, uh, John Callender, who's been over 300 species every year for the last five years, including this year. Uh, and then on the other hand, we had this super enthusiastic, uh, go to any extreme <laughs> rookie on the other side, uh, Steve, uh, which was a lot of fun to see him just blaze through everything. Uh, there, no obstacle was out of reach for him. I think he added three new modes of transportation to the whole uh, big year uh, uh, weapon set or, or tool set, if you will. Uh, in addition to cars and, and everything and, and walking and all of that, Steve actually used an airplane and a cruise ship and an e-bike to go out there and get even more species. And that's just uh, that's just really exciting. So. My hat's off to Steve for that. Uh, so I didn't even know about the airplane. What's the, what's the airplane story? Well, he had to fly out of the county to get his repositioning crews. Oh, right, right, right. So, you know, so that was the first step. <laughs> he didn't count any species from the airplane, though, so we're okay there. <laughs> you know, but, something uh, you brought up. Thing, and I wish I could have joined him on that. It just didn't work out. They started canceling the reposition cruises and everything, so... Anyway, final result for me, and then I'll get get out of here, I think. Um, I also, in those five and a half weeks that I was worried about having to leave the county, I picked up an extra 310 species. So my 2022 world list was 640 species, which made it a really, really fun year. Uh, the other thing that's funny, I go, well, wow, I don't know if I'm out of the county for 38 uh, days, can I make it? Well, John was possibly out of the county that many days. And, and here's another thing. I bird full time. I don't, I'm retired. John's working full time. <laughs> and uh, still to be able to get out and work in all that birding to get to where he is, he's the master. Uh, John, we had a different name for him during the year. I, you know, sometimes he was the bear, sometimes he was the terminator, but we just kept telling Steve that he was coming. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about this bear thing. I'm like, you know, <laughs> if I'm the bear, like I'm, I'm a cute, cuddly bear. I'm not out there coming after you. I'm not giving you a hard time. And in fact, you defeated the bear. So what does that make you? You're like the Sasquatch or something. <laughs> You're definitely a cute, cuddly bear, John. <laughs> Um, so, okay, okay, and there, you were going to say something, Steve, uh, well, uh, talking about know, the gonna, cruises or? Yeah, I was going to say that one thing I learned from this year uh, is that ocean birds are definitely the the untapped resource. I mean, they're I, looking at our lists, we had all these lists. In fact, maybe you should show the Venn diagram and I'll talk um, about it in that. Sure. Uh, David, is okay if I take over the screen share again? No, no, it's my screen. <laughs> no, one last final thing. Okay, yeah, my yeah. favorite bird of the whole year uh, was the streaked shearwater, uh, a mega rarity seen on the October 1st pelagic trip, and uh, only the second sighting ever for Southern California. The first was 20 years ago. So, yeah, that was an amazing year, bird huh? to see. I think that was a highlight for everybody who was on that, that uh, October 1st pelagic trip. Exactly. Anyway, I'm going to stop my share. It's all yours, John. Thank you. Yeah, my memory of that uh, experience is it's even almost as memorable, well, more memorable for me than seeing the street shearwater was on the trip back to the dock. You know, Dave Perexta coming up and giving me a big hug. He was so excited. He was like, oh, my gosh, you know, he's just celebrating. <laughs> really like seeing that bird. See, huggable bear. There you go. Yeah, see, so hugging is a theme. <laughs> well, Remember that bird had only been seen once before in the county, and it was Dave Peresca 
that was one of the, the birders who had seen the first one in the yeah. county here and in the first one in Southern California. Okay, so this is one of two uh, diagrams I wanna share. And what this is, so Steve prepared this uh, Venn diagram. I think, you know, it started doing this fairly early in the in the year, but it turned out it was super useful for the four of us. And this may well be one of those things that's very, you know, intensely interesting to four, exactly four people in the world and completely opaque or uninteresting to everybody else in the world. But what it allowed us to do was we could keep track of which species we each had that were unique and which ones you know other people had that we did not have or which ones we shared in common. And this was super helpful because if we were out birding and we saw a bird, it might be a bird that we already had. So we think, oh, that's not such a big deal. But then we realized, oh, you know, Steve still needs that bird. So we could, you know, text him and have the fun of, of seeing him come racing along to try and see that bird and, and help him get on the bird. Um, and also, you know, in terms of competition, it was like, well, you know, if I go, if a rarity shows up, see, so one of the things that that I'll say about Steve in particular, I mean, all of, all of you, but Steve in particular, that was so impressive, that made me not at all confident once he took the lead later on in the year. Like, I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to retain, I'm not going to be able to get that lead back because every rarity that shows up, I go there and Steve's already there. You know, he's, he was chasing everything so quickly. Um, but if I can get one of the species that he had that I don't have, there's no way for him to counter that. So that was that made these you know these birds that Steve had that no one else did real targets. You know if I could figure out a way to see those, uh, you know turns out a lot of those are ones you got on that repositioning cruise where you're you know well offshore and it's hard to get there. Um, so I do want to ask about this repositioning cruise thing. In fact, you know what, let me go on to the the next uh, slide. So I'm not sure how how readable this is uh, for on your, your shared Zoom screen. But this was another really interesting graph that Steve prepared that shows you know, a color a color coded line for each of us four. Um, so Steve is sort of the orange line that ends up at the top at the end of the year. And you can kind of follow along and just see where, you know, there's, there's vertical spikes where we got a bunch of birds in one day and the pelagic trips were responsible for that a lot of the time because you, know, you go out on a good pelagic trip and you get five or six species you, you didn't have before. Um, or, or more. Um, but then there's also these flat lines, <laughs> which again, in a lot of cases correspond to being out of the county. Like if, if, you know, and when, so I'm the green line here. And yeah, a lot of these times when I'm flat for an extended time, uh, it's because I was on a trip somewhere else. I was in San Diego for a week or we went to Mammoth for, for a week. And I'd see the rarity reports coming in and I'd know that you folks were getting those birds, you know, I was not getting them. And I'd just be hoping, oh, please be still be there on Saturday when I'm back in the county, which most I of the time- I remember yeah. with the winter wren time, John was sitting out of the county, we were all in communication and he'd be like forming this list. I'm gonna get back and I have to go see these five birds that have shown up while I was gone. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um. So I was going to ask you about the repositioning cruise. So I guess that's this this little vertical spike here in May. Yes. And if I mean again, if you're intensely interested in this and you're following along, that was really where you closed the gap with me, and that was where I was like, oh, you know, this could be game over because once I've lost my lead, I don't know how I'm going to get it back. Um, so when I tell when I talk to people about you know just the lengths you went to. Uh, one of the things I talk about is, and he even went on one of these repositioning cruises where they have, you know, cruise ships that are kind of, you know, deadheading from a less desire along, a, you know, a route from one location to another where they don't have a lot of people uh, taking the cruise. And so they're repositioning, but you can get tickets on those. You can go on them. And this repositioning cruise, you know, went steaming by Santa Barbara County. And so where did this cruise actually start and finish? So this cruise went from San Diego to Vancouver, Canada. And it, um, Happened to, it was a week long cruise, but it spent three daylight hours going through Santa Barbara deep waters. So that was the value of it. So and is so, it actually true that for you, that cruise was all about those three hours? Like, yeah, I mean, I, that was a big part of going on that cruise, right? Because I wanted to see, uh, we had just got on a pelagic. You see that there a few a couple weeks earlier. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, we got some things, but if you recall back in the spring, suddenly there are all these alerts coming from all these out of town people who are on cruise ships going by. There'd be like a burst of seven birds or a burst of eight birds that they had found way out there on the continental shelf drop off. Yeah. So 
I was disappointed the pelagic didn't get it. And so my wife and I went to went on this cruise and just for three hours, it was worth it. Although, as you know, it's a tough trade-off because then I had to vacation for a week out of town. <laughs> so, out of the county, right. So, but it turned out to be, I mean, I ended up with, I think, three birds from that cruise that I didn't see anywhere else, which was good. You know, that's, it's amazing that every bird matters when you're doing this thing. So the Lazan albatross, the Murphy's petrel, and the Hawaiian petrel? Right. Yeah. Three yep. birds that I have never seen. You know, I, I've I've never seen those birds anywhere. So, I really think that these um, repo cruises, we should, you know, they should be more common for us to do because they are not expensive either. If you get the um, the starter cabin that they have, it's not that expensive, and it's um, and it's kind of like a pelagic. A lot of people go on these pelagic boat trips, and but they're a little scary because if you get seasick. It's a smallish boat and you're rocking and rolling, but a cruise ship is very, very stable. Like people are actually setting up their birding scopes on the deck. It's so stable. You can be using a telescope to look at birds, just like you're standing on shore. So I really recommend it. In fact, I think the biggest missed opportunity, we could have all had another 10 species, I think. If, if the cruise had happened. There was one in the fall that was going to be just cruising back and forth through Santa Barbara waters. It was perfect. Way out there in the deep, on the continental shelf drop off. So that would have been awesome. But they canceled it because of COVID, basically. So this Maybe year... Not, not enough forward. obsessive birders who are willing to like go on a trip that's just cruising around in offshore Santa Barbara County. Water. Well, I mean, it goes from San Diego to San Francisco and then back. And so it's, you know... The funny, other funny thing about these cruises is it's total luxury and everybody else, you were talking hundreds of people on the boat are doing their thing and eating at the buffets and watching the, the Vegas style shows. They're all having a grand time. And there's these birders trekking through like three of them on this whole boat and they'll be carrying their scopes and dressed for the wind to go stand in the bow. It's, you kind of feel like a little counterculture there. Yeah. Um, okay, well, uh... You know, obviously, I could talk about this uh, for a very long time. Oh, here's so we're talking about the Williamson sapsucker on Christmas. I went up and got that bird the next day. It was very convenient that you know Jay Bishop, who's been in some of these meetings, uh, you know, it was in his front yard and he was coming out. He's like, oh yeah, it was in this tree. He was hanging out. You know, she was the it's a female sapsucker. She was in there, you know, earlier this morning. So it ended up. I think everybody who wanted to see that bird had a good chance to see it because it hung around for several days. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and and stop the screen share. Uh, I did uh, any any final thoughts on the county big year experience before we we move on to kind of more did, wide sharing. I did have a very important point I wanted to say, which is the only reason it was possible to do was how welcoming the community is in Santa Barbara. Like, I haven't gone to any Audubon meetings because I I joined after COVID, so I just met people out in the field and everybody is so nice. And I'd go birding with people. Like I went birding with Florence. She'd show me a whole bunch of tips about how to spot birds and how to hear birds in particular. And I and I went on the big pine drill with Mark Holmgren. I mean, just everyone was very welcome. Of course, the blues really taught me most of what I learned for like the full first half year entirely. They were, I can't even imagine the silly questions I was asking David and Linda, that you were very patient with me. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, you know, as I say, it was, it was, it was almost more fun see than seeing the birds, was seeing how excited you were at, at seeing all the birds. So that definitely made it worthwhile and enjoyable. Uh, uh, David or Linda, any, any last comments? Yeah, Linda, you've been very quiet. You know, you're sort of the, the unsung hero here. You were out there in the field, the, you know, as much as any of us, and you're, you know, uh, for a while, you were leading the, the the competition, so you know you're you're being very uh, very mild mannered here in terms of singing your own praises. Yeah, well, it was really fun. Um, want to pause that, David? Um, it was fun because Steve was so excited, and um, I wanted to get your number from last year. What did you have last year? Three thirty something. Uh, I think I'm, I'm not sure. I, even, I think I, you got right around to what I was able to get to last year. Yeah, that was my goal. And so in the beginning, we were kind of compete. Steve and I, for sure, were like, get, get John, get John. John's got another bird. 
And um, then it just became like the four of us were really having fun together. And that was nice. It was nice how many people helped all of us too. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the, I mean, especially later in the year when the species got harder to come by, yes. a lot of this was people finding a bird and putting the word out about it and then staying right. there for hours, you know, so we had time to get there and they could point it out to us like the long spurs at Ealing's Park. Right, right. That was great. Yeah, and I have to say Noah was really a big help to me several times. Really nice. Okay, well, thank you guys uh, again thank you. very much for being willing to share that um, and for the whole year. Uh, I, I wanted to go around the group and give everybody a chance to kind of talk about their most memorable birding experiences of, uh, of 2022. I, I want to go quick, and I realize I've monopolized a lot of time talking about this silly competition that I was really excited and part of. But, um, you know, everybody has their own birding experience, and I want, I want to get a chance to hear from some others about, you know, what was your most memorable bird or your favorite bird of the year or just a, a favorite birding experience. And, and feel free to just, you know, go ahead and unmute and chime in. And, you know, if it gets too chaotic, we'll, we'll start, you know, having more of a structure for lining up. But I think we could just go with whoever wants to talk first. Don't be shy. Hi, John. Hi, so who's that talking? Florence. Oh, hi, Florence. Yeah, I think I've got the video off, uh, yeah. which I usually do on these Zooms anyway. I don't want anybody to see what I look like at home. I look bad <laughs> enough in the field. So um, I just was going to say, I didn't try to have a big year this year, but because of your efforts and all the things and the great fall migration we had, I've never hit 300 species in a year since I began keeping track. And I started doing this during COVID. I thought, oh, good, I'll get 300 species this year. And then I realized it was impossible because there were no pelagics that year. Ever since then, I've kept up the spreadsheet. And without even trying, I think I ended up at 317 species this year. And it was kind of like writing you guys' coattails. So I ended up with a big year, even though I didn't try to have one. And I thank you for, you know, for all of your efforts because I benefited. Well, that's awesome. And, you know, you were supplying the intelligence on a lot of those birds that, that we got, you know, because you were out there in the field going everywhere, it seems like. Yeah, well, I don't eber, but as I said, by my own records, I had, I think it was 317. I have to double check, but and I couldn't believe it myself. So anyway, nice. I enjoy your efforts because I benefited. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to want to share about last year? Suzanne, yeah. Well, I certainly did not come. Oh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, did not have a chance to compete. I didn't even try <laughs> because I, I don't have enough time. I probably don't even have, I have enthusiasm, but not that much. But what I really uh, wanted to uh, improve was my, my photography because I like that so much. And I um, actually one. Uh, one day I thought to upgrade or get a different lens. So I rented from lensrentals.com this uh, 200 to 600 millimeter lens for my Sony camera and took it out. It was actually the first time I first day I had it, took it out to call, call, oil, call oil point resolve reserve <laughs> where the snowy plovers are. And there I saw uh, there were several turns flying around. And I thought that's, <laughs> that's how I'm going to try out this lens. And I had so much fun doing that and actually um, thought, of course, I make all these mistakes when I post my bird things. <laughs> John knows that well. <laughs> One of them <laughs> I thought was an Arctic turn, but it was not. But there were common turns, Foster's turns, and Royal turns, all three of them. And I captured some of them in flight with, uh, with prey in their beak. And I, I was really happy about that. So. I think that was a special day out there. Thank I remember you. those birds. I think I chased some of those birds. <laughs> well, thank you for, for taking those photos and sharing them. Uh, anyone else want to want to share a memory? Yeah, Tom. Uh, in 2022 was great for us because Lala and I had planned on birding every single day and submitting to eBird, which we did. We also had planned to do a lot of uh, five mile radius birding. So five miles radius in cafeteria. So, uh, which we really enjoyed and loved. But the third thing, which was the best thing is we have a, a 
Bird Nerd group on Tuesdays. And it's Burning with Friends. I love Burning with Friends. I love when I met Steve burning down in uh, Goleta at the Tech Park. I love being with our friends and, and bumping into people. And David and Linda, we bumped into the other day at uh, the Carpentry Estuary. And, and I have to say that is one of the best parts, besides being out in nature, is being with friends and making new friends out there burning. So that was 2022. Um, yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, anyone else want to want to share about last year? Favorite bird? Kim, I see you turned your video on. Does that mean you're ready to? I did. I'm done. I'm done with my bike ride, so I can actually talk. <laughs> um, so I, uh, well, I I haven't really looked at my stats. So you guys all made me made me excited to look at them. Um, in 2021, I wasn't really birding too much and I didn't do very, I didn't have, uh, very many at all. And then last year I got up to 219. So I was really happy with that. I had nice. 61, I think in 2021, and I think I had 20 in 2020. <laughs> so, so I think last year was for me a very big year. And I think, you know, one of the, I echo uh, what Tom just said, because I just, I love getting out there. I, I have seen so many places around the county that I have not seen before. I mean, honestly, I had not really ever been to Andre Clark Bird Refuge until uh, this year when I started to to bird and I didn't I didn't I had been to the little beach where all the ducks are with my kids but I didn't know that you could go all the way around and there was just so much wildlife there and then just recently I went out to the north campus at UCSB and that was beautiful um one of my favorite ones was in the fall when uh, the migration was happening and I went up to uh, the Franklin Trail and did that big loop. Oh my gosh, it was just, it, it was it was mind boggling. I couldn't, I had to just resort to taking pictures and coming home and spending hours for the next week pouring over my pictures and trying to figure out what things were because I just couldn't ID them out there on the fly. So learned a lot and you guys have all been a huge huge help and these meetings are great because you just learn so much well, and well, I, I you know i i call it my alzheimer's prevention program <laughs> yeah I'm hopefully it'll have that effect for all of us <laughs> learning so much yeah yeah so well, thanks, thanks everybody yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate seeing your reports too. And you know, you helped out a lot during the Christmas count. You were up there yeah. burdening those spots, right? You were on the, the Franklin Trail, is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I did that same loop. It was a little quieter in the winter than it was in the fall migration, but yeah. it was still just a, a joyous loop. It's a really great time yeah, up there. A, I hope it's not a, too uh, um, uh, muddy and burned yeah, out. I mean, so, with all the rain. There was an update. They they closed the upper part of the trail due to damage from the rain. I want to say, I'll, you know, after the meeting, I'll dig up the information and I'll forward it to you if you didn't get it. But um, or maybe Jenny, maybe you know, or Pat, maybe you know, maybe someone knows already. Yeah, someone if someone has the definitive info, please weigh in. What is the status of the Franklin Trail right now? Well, I was on the trail this morning, and but I went almost almost to the gate. Um, it, it's really good up to Frank's bench. And then on the fire road up to the gate, it gets a little bit more dicey. I okay. ended up turning around because it looked like there were quite a bit of, um, um, there was a lot of debris on the fire road and stuff. So mm -hmm. I just didn't go on further than that. But certainly up to Frank's bench, other than a sinkhole in the very, <laughs> on the very first hill, um, which is pretty easy to get around. Um, it it really is good. It's in good shape. And and Jenny, were you trying to offer some additional info? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got an email from um, John Culbertson forwarded, and and some of the the trail maintenance people. I, the number in my head is that the two point two mile mark might be where it's officially closed off. 
which if that's, I'm remembering, yeah, and if I remember that's and that's a little bit before the the loop that that uh, Kim was talking about at the 1913 trail down into Sutton Creek. So I think that part may not be accessible right now, but hopefully it'll be accessible soon because that is a really great spot. Yeah, I I think they were working on it today, John, but I I could uh, I could be wrong about that, but I I thought that someone I met on the trail had said that they were back there working today, but I don't know how long it will take to get it open. Okay, well, we'll keep our, our eyes peeled. Um, so again, I wanna kind of move things along, but is there anybody else who wants to share a favorite birding memory from last year? Uh, and we'll try and go quick. Yeah, yeah, Paul. Real, real, real quickly, I, I wanna echo what Tom said about birding with friends and uh, special thanks to Tom and Laurel for including Linda and I. Uh, as those of you birded with me know, I'm in a, I have a mobility issue and I'm in a chair. So they go to places where I can, I can wheel around. And I think the three birding experiences that were big thrills, it was finding birds we were going to look for. We found the orchard oriole, uh, we found the red start and it hopped around and put on a little show for us in the parking lot. Uh, and then the vermilion flycatcher. Uh, they were just, they were ones we went out to see and weren't sure we could and we found them and that was fun. So birding, I may, I may catch the birding bug. <laughs> well, you sound like you have the early symptoms there. The, uh, yeah, that whole thing about, you know, going after a particular individual bird and actually being able to find it. Uh, I think there's a number of people here who can relate to that experience because it's, it's very motivating to the right sort of person. Um, okay, uh, any any last sharing before we move on to the year ahead? Okay, well, let's move on then. And uh, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, here we go. Um, so did I do that correct? Are you seeing my... Um, oh, wait, no, I didn't do it yet. Let's try that. Uh, you're seeing a black screen if I, if I did this correctly. There, are you seeing a, a white crown sparrow? Yes, okay. So uh, the year ahead, 2023. Uh, so here again, I um, this is a, a photo I took on the trip up for the Morro Bay Bird Festival. So for me, uh, photography is something I've really gotten into lately. You know, I upgraded my camera gear. So for my 2023, one of my main focuses is, is working on my bird photography and trying to do a better job with that, which it turns out is just as challenging, if not more so, as, as getting 300 species, you know, because the birds don't necessarily want to have their photo taken. And you know, you got to be in the right place at the right time and deal with a lot of equipment issues. And But it's very fun. Uh, and certainly, to me, the results justify it. And, you know, I get a lot of satisfaction out of not just seeing the bird, but actually bringing back a record of what I saw and being able to share it. Um, something I did want to talk about a little bit, and this is sort of a, a repeat of something I talked about in the, um, the birding by ear meeting that we had. Uh, I forget when exactly, it was like a number of months ago. But I was talking about uh, the impacts of using playback and my experience of, of, of learning about that. And I, so I wanted to share, because the other thing I wanted to share about what I'm doing next year is uh, I'm working on making my birding uh, less impactful. Uh, that is, I'm, I'm working on making it so that my birding doesn't affect the birds in a negative way or other birders or other people. Um, so I wanted to talk about that in just a little bit of detail. Uh, by talking about this bird. So um, this was in Deer Park Canyon uh, back in 2019. And I was really excited. I just gotten my, my first birding camera that I've updated, upgraded a few times since then. But I was really excited about taking pictures of birds. And uh, there was a bell sparrow and I'd gotten a brief glimpse of it in the binoculars. And I really wanted to get a photo of it. So I took out my, my you know, smartphone and I pulled up the Sibley app and I played uh, the song of the bell sparrow. And it worked like a charm. This bird, you know, heard another bell sparrow in his territory and he reacted. He came popping out into view and came up to take a look at me. And I got this photo and I was feeling very proud of myself. Uh, like, oh yeah, this is great. I, I could really do this and it's, it's awesome. And then this blur went by the side of my head and a, a sharp shinned hawk blasted into the bush trying to catch and eat this bird that I'd been so excited to photograph. Um, and uh, as it turns out, it, the sharp chin talk was unsuccessful, which was a relief, I'm sure, to the, the Bell Sparrow and a relief to me. But it uh, brought home to me just the notion that, oh, you know, I may think that my impact on these birds by doing things like, like using playback is, is very negligible and isn't really bothering the birds. Or maybe, you know, 
interrupts their day for a minute or two, but it doesn't really have a big effect. But in thinking about this experience in particular, I realized, you know, these birds are making decisions that have life and death consequences. And for me to play the recording of a rival Bell's sparrow in this sparrow's territory, it made a, you know, decision like, oh, I'm going to break cover to try and drive this intruder off or go check out what's going on in a way that placed its life at very real risk. And the, you know, the sharp shinned hawk tried to take advantage of that. So it just made me think a little more about the impacts of my activity on birding. And if and when I think about like the history of it, you know, John James Audubon famously back in the, the 19th century, his way of identifying birds was to shoot them with his shotgun. I mean, that was just sort of an accepted practice at the time. And, you know, for bird study in that era, that was how you did it. Uh, you know, clearly that could not survive uh, at, at current levels of bird watcher and, you know, participation without it causing all kinds of problems. Uh, but even the kinds of things that we do these days can have an impact. And again, in that same meeting, I showed a little clip of this video of, of uh, birding Bob in Central Park. He leads bird tours there. And he's a very avid user of, of playback. He plays like recorded bird vocalizations on the speaker he's holding up there to bring birds into view. And, you know, I don't want, I mean, I'm not in a position to debate him about that. And I don't want to have a debate with, with anyone who chooses to do that. I mean, I have done it myself. Uh, but I, as I do think about it, I, I think that these kinds of uh, techniques, to the extent they're effective, you know, kind of, uh, maybe something that we as a birding community, or at least me as an individual birder, uh, might want to evolve past. I might want to leave in like the, the history of, of the activity, you know, when we used to do these things like shooting the birds with a shotgun to see what they were. Um, by the same token, disrupting their lives with recorded playback um, might be something that, that people want to reconsider, or again, just for myself, because I'm not telling anybody else how to bird. I might want to do less of so that kind of leads me to, you know, kind of think about the larger spectrum of ways that I I enjoy birding or I experience birds, and and to realize that you know the amount of impact varies based on how I conduct myself, and you know even just being out there in the field, even if I'm just quietly sneaking along, I'm affecting the birds. You know, I'm I'm there influencing them by being in their habitat. So I, I don't think there's any way for me to really enjoy the experience meaningfully without some disruption. So it's not like a black or white thing I'm talking about. It's more like, well, just thinking of how can I do less of that disruption in a way that makes me feel better about how I'm participating. Um, so uh, so I, I, for this year, one of the things I'm, I'm working on for my own birding is this idea of low impact birding. So birding in a way that, that I feel has less impact on the birds. Um, so one thing is, is less pishing. And I'm include, I'm, by that, I'm, I'm including any kind of sound attractant. So I've, I have largely stopped using pishing, which again is you know imitating a mobbing recruitment call going ch -ch 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 to try and get the bird to pop into view and let you see it. Because again, I don't wanna mess with them that way. I'm, you know, to the extent that pishing is effective, it's effective because it's disrupting what the birds would have chosen to do otherwise. Um, and I'm including with that all kinds of sound attractants like playback. I'm, I'm trying to avoid the use of playback in, in most cases. Now, I do, you know, occasionally backslide a little bit. <laughs> and most recently on the Carpinteria Christmas Count, I was up with Fred Jugula before sunrise in Romero Canyon listening for owls. And we had great horned owls, but we did not hear the Western screech owls that I knew were up there because I'd had them there before using playback. And I was chatting with Fred, like, well, you know, I'm kind of doing this thing where I'm not really using playback now. So uh, I think I'll, 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 we won't use playback this morning. But then I joked with him, but if we get up to 159 species, you know, this afternoon, and we're, we're just missing that one bird, you know, I might reconsider. Well, at like 4 p.m. on Christmas count day, we were at 159 species reported. And I was like, oh, I got to go up there and try and get those Western screech owls. So I went back up and I did use playback and I did hear Western screech owls. So I was very excited about that. And then subsequently found that actually we had a couple more species come in. So it wasn't quite the exciting, you know, threshold uh, breaking through that 160 species barrier that I thought of, but it, but it was part of it. Anyway, so it's not a black and white thing, but I'm trying to do less use of sound attractants. Uh, less pushing. So this is just, these are just mnemonic devices in my head. 
And this is the idea that I would not uh, approach the birds so slowly that I make them move away from me. So I'm trying to avoid doing that. And you know, it's always this tension. And certainly if you're trying to get a good look or you're trying to get a photo, especially, there's always the urge to get closer to the bird. Um, but if by doing so the bird is moving away, I'm, I'm trying to remind myself, okay, that is the bird communicating to me that it is not comfortable with my presence. And maybe I should just content myself with a more distant photo. Uh, less trashing, uh, which is, is habitat related. Uh, you know, there have been some rarities that people were leery of reporting more widely in the local birding community because of the concern that people, all the avid birders going there to try and see those birds would like break down sensitive vegetation in like a, a wetland area. So, you know, being more mindful of the effects that, that my activity might have on the habitat, less mobbing. So I, this is, you know, mobbing is like a bird term, but it's, it, I'm using it here to mean uh, less of the activity where I'm with a big group of birders which, you know, again, if you're chasing rarities, it kind of goes with the territory. Uh, that you know, if there's a sufficiently good rarity, there's going to be 15 or 20 people there trying to see it. And, you know, for my own 2023 low impact birding uh, pledge that I'm making to myself, I'm, I'm expecting to do less of that. You know, not that I will do none of it. I'll probably still chase some birds. But just to be aware uh, as I'm doing it, that if I'm in a big group of people, big enough that it may be affecting the bird in a way that's counter to this goal, then maybe I'll just, you know, not participate or just leave and come back later when it's not so crowded. Um, less trespassing. Uh, you know, I think the standard birder advice is, you know, no trespassing, thou shalt not trespass. But uh, in reality, there are uh, birding locations that are on private property that kind of fall into this gray area where you know, avid birders go there, but they go there knowing that it's not completely, it's not like it's public. And then when you see it, but you know, the property owner either doesn't care or hasn't noticed or been bothered enough for them to make an issue out of it. But if you find a really good bird there, then you have this conundrum because if you report it and a bunch of people go there to see it, maybe that means you will lose access going forward. Uh, so again, as part of this approach I'm trying to adopt, I'm just in general, being more mindful of the thought that my own personal interest in going there and seeing the bird might not be in the best interest of the larger birding community or the birds or, or other people who are not birders who nevertheless maybe don't want people traipsing through their property. So again, trying to be more mindful of, of striking that balance in a way that respects these, these sort of ethical considerations of, of others' interests, not just my own excitement to see the bird. Uh, less driving. So again, you know, uh, Steve, in your, your big year, you know, you were mostly driving your, your Tesla. So you were at least not burning fossil fuels directly as part of your, you know, jetting all over the county the way uh, I was. Uh, but even so, you know, as part of you know, doing my part to, uh, to uh, address issues of, of climate change and, and fossil fuel use, um, I'm expecting to do more local birding, more of this like 5MR birding that people were talking about. I think I'll be doing a lot more birding closer to closer to home or even places I can walk from my house uh, and not so much being driven to go you know, out to the far corners of the county to try and get the next species. Um, okay, so that was sort of my long-winded spiel about what I'm expecting to do in the coming year, but I'm very interested in hearing uh, from other people. Uh, you know, do you have goals for 2023? Do you have, you know, are you, do you have a program for the birding you expect to do in 2023? Are you doing things differently this year? Are you doing things the same this year? Uh, you know, from looking at Ebert, I know David and Linda, you're out there working hard on birds already. Like I see you uh, climbing those rankings and, you know, I can't help but look at the county uh, year list rankings and see who's at the top. And currently the last time I checked, Linus Blumquist was at the top and he's setting a pretty, pretty torrid pace there. So uh, those of you who want to do the county uh, big year thing might might need to get your yourself saddled up and get out after Linus because he's he's putting it at he was putting that number up higher. But anyway, uh, who who would uh, be willing to share about uh, their current birding plans, what they plan to do going forward? So Linda Rose, I think you're talking, but you're muted. Are you are you chiming in? Nope. Okay. <laughs> you're talking, you're intentionally muted. You're, you're sharing things that we are not necessarily privy to, which is fine. You're, you're welcome to participate however you choose. Well, I could say that after a year of, of doing the bird count, I feel like now it's my duty to get to the next stage because the thing that makes the bird count work for 
the people who are out there chasing the birds is everybody else is out there finding the new birds for them to go chase. So I'm really looking forward this year to trying to be one of the magical people like Florence. Florence does a lot of this, goes out and is the first person to see the zone-tailed hawk or the something rare. And then, then a horde of birders comes and looks at it. But boy, it turns out to be 10 times harder to be the person who first finds it. So I'm hoping to do more of that because that's like the next level. And it is in some ways more satisfying. I mean, it's satisfying to go chase a species, but to find one, find something rare yourself is, is a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I think Lin Linus was sharing something, some term in Swedish, I think, for like, that translates as noble species, like keeping track of the birds you actually find, not the birds that are reported by someone else. Right. It's something like Adelkris, and it means sort of a noble, special bird. Cool. Well, maybe we can all do more of that. Uh, other other perspectives. I mean, I don't. I mean, I've kind of monopolized this, and I apologize. I mean, that's sort of a, a habit I fall into in these meetings when I'm presenting like my own material. But but this has been to me more of a shared experience. So I want to not talk so much and and listen because I really am interested in what what people are out there doing. John, I, John, I just unmuted myself. If you can hear me. Yeah, I hear you, Florence. Okay. Well, Steve's giving me more credit than I deserve because I am infamous for being the last person on a good bird. So, you know, it tends to fly away when I show up. But I, this is what I would say is I don't go out to try to find rare things. I go out to bird to see what's there. And I, I would think that's the best approach to take. Just go out and go birding. And uh, the rarities will take care of themselves. And sure, I'm just gonna chase. If a county bird shows up, I'm gonna go get it, you know, that for sure. But my approach to birding is <clears throat> basically, it's just, well, this looks like a good day to hike Farron Road. So I'm gonna hike Farron Road and see what's there. And I think that's a kind of a more relaxed approach to birding. And if you bird a place well enough so that you know it's familiarity, the rarity is gonna stand out immediately because you'll know that this is something you have never seen here. That's just my own thought. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and like you say, the familiarity, you know, because we talked in some of the previous meetings this year about like, like getting better at identification or tricky bird identifications and, and that there's this transition as you get more familiar with a species, you go from identifying it to just recognizing it. It's just like, you know, a person you know and you see it and you immediately know its identity because of a subconscious process from all the familiarity you've built up. And that happens in a landscape where you're like, oh yeah, that's the that's the Buick's wren because there's always a Buick's wren there or, or whatever. And then, as you say, then something that's not typical really stands out to you. And um, okay, uh, anyone else uh, want to to chime in with what you're doing this year? I confess, I am I am curious, uh, David and Linda Blue, if you're willing to share. Like, I, I've seen you going a lot of places. You know that eBird does give a certain visibility into what people are up to. And, and you two are up to a lot, it seems like you're, you know, maybe that's just what we all look like from an outside perspective. But now that I'm doing it less, it really stands out when I see someone else doing it. Um, I think my goal is we're gonna be out of town again quite a bit this year. So my goal is I better go get what's here now that might not be here when I'm back in town. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it kind of keeps us sane to keep going every day. And I really like seeing behavior of the birds. Because you see this little wren, you see all the time, but it, yet it lose something different that will surprise you. So I'm not so sure I'm really competing. I don't know, maybe I am. I mean, I like being in the top 10, <laughs> but I don't really think I'm competing as much as we just need to get out. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. What do you think, David? Oh, I think birding is fun and every day from the last 800 and almost 50 days, I'm going out birding and it's just a fun thing to do. Linda and I, you know, the night before or even the morning of, it's like, what bird would you like to see today? And then we go off and try to find that bird. It's, it's typically a bird we haven't seen before. So we'll go look for it, maybe to be the first one to find it, maybe just to stumble into something, or maybe it's a bird that someone else has found, but uh, we'd like to see it. Um, we've made multiple trips to Lake Jocelyn, which is on the other side of the county, sort of from us in one sense. And uh, because of the Eastern Phoebe, 
uh, hadn't seen that for a long, long time. And so it's just fun to go see that bird again and see what we noticed differently this time. So it's just that, yeah, if you look at the numbers, it might look like we're building a list, but what we're really doing is just going out birding and the list is just following what we happen to fall into. And uh, so. But John, we're also way behind last year by like 20 birds. <laughs> well, again, you know, last year, I mean, I thought I was getting off to a quick start, but if, if people would go back and maybe and watch the meeting over, you know, and see that that line graph, you two really set the pace early on. You were out there getting everything, and I thought I was getting everything, but you were still ahead of me. And then Steve kind of started a little slower, but then once he kicked into gear, it was like, oh no, you know, if there's a bird, he's going to get it. Right. So it was, you know, again, I mean, it was really fun, but it's also kind of relaxing not to have that pressure <laughs> now. Have, and yeah. Right. But it's also fun to have friends that are doing this because if you're tired or you don't want to go right back out again, somebody say, come on, let's go. And it, you know, it's, it just makes it more fun to get out. Yeah. There was no uh, question uh, that last year was special because the four of us would all see each other at all these birds. Right. If you don't go, you'll miss the party. Right. right. <laughs> A lot of it is social. Yes. Um, any uh, other? Yeah. Kim? Yeah, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, uh, Ken and I, my husband and I are um, cyclists, so we go a lot of places because there's good places to ride. We've kind of morphed that into birding as well. We we find new places because we know it's a good place to bird. And, you know, people ask us, how did you know to go there? It's because of birding, you know, it's just some something about you, you find these places because of this specific love or this specific passion and it's not it's off the beaten track it's not going to be the place where you know hordes of people go it's going to be the little place that that uh, a few people have posted about on ebird and you're you end up there and and you're like wow i would have never gotten here if i hadn't looked up looked up this so I think that is really our goal is always to find those kind of little hidden gems that yeah. we wouldn't have gone to. We went to Pinnacles just a couple months ago and we had, you know, we had driven by it on the 101. I can't tell you how many times we had driven by King City and not thought a word of it. And then this this last Christmas, we didn't have each of us, had, our kids were with their other parents. So we were like, let's go. And we went and just saw, uh, we saw about nine or 10 condors and we saw them roosting and it was just amazing. And I would have never gone to the, the pinnacles had it not been for condors and birding. So yeah. it's it's just really a fun a fun, a fun thing to do and explore, as well as you know, keeping your mind busy and being outside. Yeah, that definitely resonates with me. And you know, my experience, it, the the whole county year list and the chasing phenomenon, really the most memorable thing about that whole experience for me, besides the the people, you know, getting to know the the different people involved and, and the social aspect, was just the places I ended up that I would never have gone otherwise. You know, I think. Steve, you were making a comment in an email chain about how early in the year last year you saw David and Linda and then me going out to the Kiyama Valley, and you thought, that's ridiculous. Why would anybody go all the way out to this, you know, I, mean, I don't remember how you actually phrased it, but this remote, you know, desert, you're like, what's the point? Why would you even go there? And then, you know, a week or two later, you were going there because you were trying to see those birds. That was a big one. It took me a month to work up the the moxie or to, to get real like that was when I had to decide okay I'm doing it I'm driving all the way to Kiyama this place that I had never heard of I didn't even know it existed yeah, <laughs> yeah well, me too yeah. all right well I think that's a that's a good note to maybe wrap things up on uh anybody else want to we have one last share one last round of, of sharing uh certainly if you haven't chimed in you're welcome to Okay, I see, I see no one jumping to share. Uh, well, I'll just wrap it up then and, and thank everybody again for uh, a great year of birding last year and what I'm uh, expecting is gonna be a great year of birding ahead. 
Um, certainly, if you can come out on uh, Saturday, and we'll go birding together out at uh, out at the bluffs. Um, and you know the condor. You're mentioning the condors, Kim. So, just if you check the Ventura County uh, email list for Ventura County birding, they had a. Um, there have been two different condors seen just on the other side of uh, uh, Lake Casitas. Oh, okay. like out the 150. Uh, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, th there's a location that I, when I looked in the map, it was just, you know, east of Lake Casitas, but that's mm -hmm. only like, what, like six or eight miles from here. So uh, keep your eyes up. Those of you, you know, southeast corner of the county birders, you you carp specific birders, uh, definitely keep your eyes to the skies. If you see something up that looks more like an airplane than a turkey vulture, <laughs> uh, give it a careful look because we could get a condor. I've never had a condor in Santa Barbara County and I would love to, so I'm certainly going to be looking up. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you again all very much for, for participating and sharing and uh, I look forward to seeing you Saturday or chasing some rarity or just whatever we happen to be birding together sometime in the future. So thanks. Thank you. Charlie. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.